Hello fellow translators. Today's video will be about a very bad review that I received on my book. So this is my latest book, How to Set Up Your Own Translation Agency, that I, I talked about here. I, re I released it recently. And it's uh, based on the course that I have, uh, which does quite well by the same name. When you receive a bad review, well, it always sucks, but there are two types of bad reviews. You get one bad review that basically says, oh, this is the worst product ever. Uh, I wish I could give it zero stars, but so I'll just give it one star and that's it. And you can't do anything with those. Nothing really constructive there. But the other types of reviews have some constructive criticism, constructive comments that you can actually work on. And this is this type of review. So actually, I do appreciate that. And that's why I wanted to go through it with you guys quickly and address some of these points. So let's go to the review itself. And uh, here we go. Let's read it quickly and see. It's by Worcester32. So this is a pet peeve of mine when people won't leave their real name because, you know, you can hide behind the internet. But fine, we'll, we'll let that go because, um, because, yeah, there are some points here that I want to address. So anyway, common sense knowledge, even if that, definitely not by an industry expert, okay? Poorly written as well. I would ask for a refund if there is such an option. Uh, uh, just briefly, um, I mean, yeah, I guess I'm not an industry expert in, tr in the translation industry. However, I do make a living from running my translation agency. So I think I do have some authority to speak and just kind of detail my journey and the stuff I learned and stuff like that in, uh, in this book. Anyway, fine. Poorly written as well. I'm sorry you, you feel that way. I don't ask for a refund if there's such an option. By the way, there is such an option. On, well, I guess it depends if you got the paper version or the, or the Kindle version. But uh, they're, you know, they do have that option on Amazon, you know. Anyway, details. Some shady practices are featured. For example, it is suggested that you outsource your work to other translators while pretending that you are doing the work yourself. Then you could eventually admit to the client and just let them face the facts. It is added that this is, after all, a risky approach, but then nevertheless suggested. Um, yeah, that sounds really shady when you put it that way, I guess. So let me get into it. Let me, let me uh, read the rest first, and, uh, and I'll get into uh, uh, explaining these points. Another weird advice is pretending you have offices around the world by buying P.O. Box services and asking your relatives or some shared office spaces to check your physical email once a week. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, and uh, if, if someone is ever going to start a translation company based on this piece of written material and faking who they are, that's pretty sad. I've been researching other books in the translation industry, and there are indeed a few good ones out there. Note, I have not read any other books by this author that dwell on freelance translating. Not a chance. Um, okay, a couple things uh, before I get into it. Uh, you've been reading other books in the translation industry. Well, there are other books on the translation industry, but there are no other books on setting up a translation agency. So, you know, sorry, you're kind of stuck with this one if you want a book on that. And at least as far as when I read, you know what? I'm going to search for it quickly. Cause at least when I wrote it, there wasn't any other book. Yeah, this one, marketing to translation agencies. So that's about marketing to them. And then there's my book here and... Uh, yeah, as far as I can tell, there are no other books in setting up a translation agency. Now, there is one book, I think it had translation company, there we go, yeah, that I remember reading this and thinking it would tell me how to set up, a, you know, it, it would be about setting up a translation agency, but it wasn't at all. It was a good book. I, I, I thought I, it was about the translation industry, basically in general, and, uh, and what goes behind the industry and stuff like that, but it's not about setting up a translation company or agency, if that's what you're looking for. In fact, you know what, I think I wrote a review. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, to be honest, if you're just starting out and want to set up a translation agency, this book won't really help you much. And look at that, Worcester362 or whatever your name is. I used my real name, first and last name. Anyway, intermission over. Let's get back to it. Going over this review, let's address the points that uh, this person mentions. Uh, I'm going to start with a second point first. Um, another way advice is pretending you have offices around the world by buying P.O. Box services and asking your relatives or some shared office spaces to check your physical mail once a week. Physical mail, I think he, he or she or it means, not physical email. Anyway, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much basically what I, what I say. Here, let, let's find the passage in the book. I can just say this is something that I do recommend because as translators, we usually deal with two different languages. This means we usually, we often deal with two different countries. So why not take advantage of this fact? If you live in the, in the US but still have contacts in Brazil, why not take advantage of that if you're setting up an agency and use mailing services or something like that in the other country? And this is exactly what I was doing, by the way. Uh, so let, let's see what I wrote in the book quickly. There, I have it right here. International offices. 
Um, having an international presence has become increasingly important, blah, blah, blah. However, it can be costly and complex process to set up offices in different countries, particularly for small business or freelancers. So why are we discussing it? I'm now based in Taiwan, the Asia office, while the North and South America office is using a relative's address. As for the Swiss office, I have a family friend who checks the mailbox once a week or so. Yes, the mailbox is under my name. So I, I, and I should mention the family friend here I actually uh, was paying her. So it's more like a personal assistant that, and uh, she'd help out with the... Uh, with a mail and um, and you know some other stuff, some other admin stuff, uh, but yeah, I mean this is basically what I was doing, and uh, and I use these addresses, and not once did it ever become an issue, you know. Now you can say, oh that's shady, it's not real, you don't really have an office there, and all that. You might have noticed a lot of companies, especially if you're in the U.S., you notice. All these companies are based out of Delaware. And you might wonder why so many companies are based out of Delaware. And I can tell you it's purely because of tax reasons. But the funny thing is, go to Delaware one day and tell me if you can find their offices. You won't be able to. None of these companies have offices in Delaware. They're just doing it for tax purposes. All these big companies do it. That's how the big boys do it. I think that's more shady than what I'm saying now because I'm saying to use countries where you actually have contacts, have a reason for having a presence there. I'm assuming as a freelancer, you cannot open an office itself with employees in another country, but at least this gives you a presence. You know, it's not as good as being there in person, but it is something. And so why not do that? If you find this is too shady, you don't have to do it. But obviously I want to mention it because it is an option and some people might want to use it. So why not use it? But anyway, I guess Worcester found it a bit too shady and feel free to let me know, maybe I'm wrong. Let me know if you do think it's too shady and I'm happy to, um, to address that. Anyway, let's go to the other thing because I think this point was kind of big. He said, yeah, some shady practices are featured. For example, it's suggested that you outsource your work to other translators while pretending that you are doing the work yourself. Okay, I already read it. Let me explain what my situation was and what I did. I was working as a freelance translator and I had a, you know, a couple clients I worked with regularly and I knew I wanted to make the transition to, to translation agency. But a very difficult thing for me was to contact these companies that I work well with and tell them, hey, from now on, I'm not gonna be doing your translations anymore, but I'm gonna be hiring someone to do them. And, uh, and so, yeah, hope that's fine. I really felt like, I felt nervous about doing it and I wasn't sure how to go about it. And at a certain point, I, I thought, well, you know what? Maybe it's better to ask for forgiveness rather than asking for permission, if that makes sense, right? So I chose a time period, I remember it was, it was super busy and I was doing a bunch of translations for this one client, but for other ones too, but they knew I was very busy. And they needed this uh, brochure translated. It was a brochure, basically a, a marketing pamphlet for a, uh, for a festival that was going on. And so I was like, okay, I'm pretty busy. I don't know, I don't know. And then I was like, okay, I can handle it. So then I handled that, including other translations and blah, blah, blah. At the end of the month, we kind of had our, we, we would have a talk every, at the end of the month, kind of a month in review and figure out, you know, for the invoice and all that. And during that talk is when I told them, I'm like, look, um, by the way, I was really swamped with everything. And so uh, there's this other Italian to English translator that I work with and she's very good. And so for the pamphlet, I just wasn't able to get it done. So I handed it off to her and, um, you know, and she did it. And obviously I looked over everything she did and made sure it was fine, you know, and I handled all that on my end, but I just wanted to let you guys know that and say in the future, I might be doing some of this as well because I'm starting to get very busy. And the client literally had no problem with it. She just said, look, as long as the quality's the same as it's been, whatever, we don't care. I was really worried mainly about confidentiality. But like I said, I've been working them, with them for a number of years. They trusted me and knew that I wasn't going to do anything stupid. And they probably trusted that whoever I worked with was, you know, professional. So yeah, she literally just said, as long as the quality keeps being okay, we're fine with it. So that might be shady, absolutely. But I remember it helped me because right after that is when I contacted my other clients and my other regular clients and I told them, hey, I'm pretty swamped. So from now on, I might work with another person to do my Italian to English translations to help me out. Everything will be seamless. I'll hand it on my end. Is that okay? And literally 100% of them were fine with it. But, uh, but it gave me the courage to do that. And that's why I wanted to share it. And like the commenter said, I did add that it's a risky approach because it is risky, but I didn't not want to share it because it is an option. It can be an option. Let's go to the book and see exactly what I wrote. And you know, you can see if you agree with me, I need to search. Wait, I guess I wrote risky. Oh yeah, there we go, risky, that, that was it. This is what I wrote. I don't necessarily condone this method, but I thought I should mention it regardless. I did give a caveat here, you know, and I said uh, kind of a warning that uh, I don't necessarily condone this method but I, shot, I thought I should mention it regardless. Like I said, you know, I didn't not want to mention it. 
While it may seem like a good idea to let your current clients know that you're expanding your business and working with other translators, it could actually end up backfiring you. So here, I give another warning here. And here, I underline it. It may cause your clients to worry about the quality of your work and blah, blah, blah. So I've got two paragraphs of warnings before I even get into it. So instead of contacting your current clients, letting them know you're now running an agency, another approach could be to have your clients perform a certain number of translations before you let them know. And then I say, as an example, if you're a French to English translator, you can find other French to English translators to work with. This is key. French to English, then you should find French to English translators. Not once did I ever say, hey, I can handle your Russian to Swedish translation. Of course not, because that's, I, I couldn't, you know, and I'm not going to pretend that's me, but it's in the same language combination and it is a translation that I could handle myself, but I just had someone else to quote unquote help out with the workload. So anyway, yeah, after they've completed a few translations, uh, you can let them know that someone else did the translations rather than you. Then you can explain that you're expanding your business, working with other translators, blah, blah, blah. And then I even say, however, keep in mind, this is a risky approach. I say here again, they may see you as dishonest or hiding things from them. So I warn you about that as well. They may were also worry about the disclosure of confidential information. This is the thing I was very worried about, like I mentioned. That's why I ended up doing a marketing pamphlet for a festival because I knew there was nothing confidential there. But yeah, the confidentiality thing was something that I was worried about. So I do mention this and yeah, I could definitely see how it could be seen as shady. I think I sort of gave enough warnings that it could be risky and shady and stuff, but I did want to bring it up because I feel bad not bringing it up at all because maybe one of you could see it as an option as long as you do it well. So I guess I want your feedback. Like, what do you guys think? Uh, do you think A, the person is correct and I should just, I guess, delete this section or something or B, maybe just, I just worded it wrong. And if I word it differently or change it up a bit, it'll sound a bit better. But you know, now, now that I explained myself, maybe it makes sense. And maybe just the way I wrote it down here was a bit shady. I don't know. Or C, do you think they were just exaggerating and I give enough warning in this explanation that uh, that is risky, but I just want to get the opportunity to mention it as a possibility. Let me know what you guys think, because I am curious. That was basically it. That's the worst review that I got for this book. So I want to share it here and kind of go over it because while I don't like the an anonymity here, and I think, yeah, it's the only review they gave. So I don't know if they set up the account just for that or not. But anyway, I do actually appreciate the constructive comments because it does give me something to work with. I don't think I'm going to come up with a second edition of this book or anything, uh, to be honest. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to get your feedback and see what you guys thought and uh, share with you this bad review that I got. So that's pretty much it. And I'll talk to you next time. Okay, thanks. Bye. Sabedum.